Welcome to Coddy Wampling Along the Dow with Noel Eastwood. This is episode two and I'd just like to say thank you to all those lovely people who have sent me messages uh, encouraging me to continue with the blog. Very much appreciate it. The, the last episode I just gave a bit of a background to myself and to the blog and what I do. This one I wanted to look a little bit more at the fool. The fool comes from, the fool in tarot comes from, uh, all of the cards come from medieval Europe, particularly Italy, Christian Italy. You must have to remember this. The, the development of the images, the symbology, filtered through the families, the wealthy merchant families that could afford to pay an artist to do the artwork and craft the cards. In the 13th, 14th, 15th century, paper was rare, super rare. They didn't have the secret of, of paper making until around that time. It, it came from China and paper was so rare that, that some countries outlawed the hoarding or the having paper in your possession. It was so expensive and rare. You know, who would use it? Well, merchants used it to keep transactions, you know, the paperwork, the bookkeeping, uh, the promissory notes, and eventually, you know, it became um, another form of money. But if I trade, you know, if I wanted to sell 50 sheep, I would be able to write that down on a piece of paper and that would go as part of the transaction and that would come back as, a, as part of the, the, the invoicing receipting and the instructions to, uh, you know, my seller in another country. So paper was very important. Cardboard came next. Now, to make a, a card today, they, it's a special cardboard that's laminated and, you know, has a, a sealing, um, like a plastic coat over it to protect it so that, it, so that you can play cards day in day out for maybe a year before they wear out back in back in the middle ages cardboard was very fragile paper was very fragile and if you sat down and play cards with your friends with that sort of, you know low quality cardboard you would not get through many games the, the cardboard cards would fall apart so quality cardboard was very important to the development of playing cards, which tarot was originally just a deck of cards with pretty pictures. When, when cards came on the scene into Europe, through the trading companies, the merchants of, of uh, Italy, um, Venice in particular, Milan, those families paid people to reproduce the cards and then to develop their own pictures. So they had family members as Trumps. They had the Pope as a Trump. They had the Emperor and the Empress as Trumps. They had um, Triumphs, the Chariot, as Trumps. They had Justice. The, the daily goings-on of their world was depicted in their deck of cards. And there was no standard to the card. They had numbered cards, 1 to 10. That was fairly standard early up. And then they had the uh, the knave, the knight, the queen and the king, which coming from India was different, from Arabia was different, from China was different. But in Italy, they had emperors and empresses. They had knights. They had kings and queens. You know, they had city-states where a king and queen would rule. So uh, over time, over a period of, you know, 100, 200 years, the... The, the standard deck of cards came about where ace to ten, jack, queen, king, page or, or knave or princess and prince came about and, and then the triumphs, the trumps. So the trumps was a, a fifth suit and there's still people playing cards today with, with tarot. That using tarot deck to play cards, its its origins were 
entertainment and gambling. Gambling was a big thing. In, in Italy, of course, the Christian faith was very, very powerful and people would send their, their sons off to be a priest. And of course, all of these young people, what can they do each day when they've finished all their, their work, you know, cleaning pots and pans and saying their prayers and studying? They would sit around and play dice, uh, dominoes, you know, whatever games they had, wrestling, anything to entertain themselves. They didn't have TV, they didn't have video, they didn't have DVD players, they didn't have iPhones, there was no internet, there was no electricity. So they had to do something and when cards came on the scene, hallelujah, here was a fantastic opportunity to create new games and to entertain themselves and their friends and of course, being big gamblers themselves, these um, monks and you know priests in training, uh, they just took to to the cards like crazy, to the point where uh, one of the popes actually outlawed cards and dice and alcohol because they're, they're just disrupting the the training of their priests. So the the deck itself is, uh, well, in, in particular, the, the, the trumps, the major arcana, clearly depicted what was going on in Italy at that time, particularly with the Christian faith and culturally, if we look at all the cards. Now, the, the fool, if we look at the fool, and I'm going to now bring up a whole heap of pictures of the fool. Here we go. Here's a standard one from the Arthur Waite deck of 1911, I think it is. And we've got a picture of, there's a stick there. There's a little bag of goodies. And he's walking along with a little puppy dog. We go back, you know, six, seven, eight hundred years ago. The fool was the, the village idiot. Uh, the village idiot could have been a child that was dropped on their head could be mental illness and we see these today in in our cities in our towns the the homeless and I've, I've worked with them a lot of you have worked with the homeless and the unemployed and people with mental illness and you know they they a lot of them will end up on the street because they they're unwell so back in these days there was no place for them you know hospices were rudimentary and they relied on the goodwill of family and the people of the village. So let's have a look. So if you want to go wandering and which which of course they would go from village to village to get a, a good feed and somewhere to stay, they might have a relative somewhere, you took a stick with you. You carried a walking stick. You bundled up your possessions in a rag or a cloth or a blanket and tied it to the stick to make it easier to carry. They, you know, a haversack or a rucksack or a backpack in those days was frightfully expensive. People didn't just go to the shop and buy them. You had to make them. You had to have someone make it for you. So what was easier? Get a blanket, you put your gear in there, you tie it up, throw it on a stick. At night time, you wrapped yourself in the blanket or the, the cloak and during the day you walked with it. The stick was to hit the dogs with. So every village had dogs. Now, if you were lucky, you had your own dog, but don't forget, you have to feed a dog. Where do you get the food from? You're gonna send the dog out into the farmer's paddocks to go and kill a sheep? No, you can't do that. So possibly the dog was the fool's dog, but would be, would be um, uncommon. This is more like the village um, pack that would attack strangers. So the stick was useful for people that tried to rob them. Uh, you know, the wanderers, the vagrants, the village idiot would be, the, you know, the, the, bear the brunt of horrible deeds. So a stick was very useful. Every traveller would have carried a stick in those days. And there were pilgrims and pilgrimages in those days as well. 
And I write about this in my The Fool's Journey Through the Tarot Cups, my latest book that I've just published. So if, uh, yeah, I, I mentioned these things in there. That's why it's rather pertinent at the moment. Um, and if you want to see The Wanderers, The Fool, just watch the news. What's happening in, in the Sudan? What's happening in, in countries that are war-torn, where entire populations, villages and cities, the entire population is has to leave. Where do they go? They go into the bush. They go and try and find somewhere to grow a few uh, sweet potatoes or, or something like that. But they become vagrants and uh, they become war refugees. Displacement due to warfare is a huge thing in our society. It has been for thousands and thousands of years. And today we see more and more of it. Displacement breeds all sorts of horrible things. Mental illness in particular. But people die. Children die first. Um, with this COVID pandemic, you know, I was speaking to one of the security guards at the hospital. Uh, it was last year. And he was saying that he's Indian. He said in his village, people are dying because... They're only allowed out of their houses for two hours a day between 10 in the morning and 12. They all rush off to the marketplace and they carry with them their belongings. Eventually, you know, they go to the market where they, they sell their belongings or they barter their belongings for food to take back home to their children. But what happens month after month, eventually you have nothing left to barter with. And he knows of friends of his family back in India that have given their food to their children and they have died themselves, the, the mother and father. It, it's a horrible situation. So when we look at the fool, it is more than just this happy guy that goes off wandering. There is a historical um, back background to these images. I'm going to show you some more. Here we go, this guy's um, getting chased by a dog, that's a little bit more accurate. Um, you know, he's almost wearing his blanket there, he's carrying a stick. Very important when you're going to walk through a stranger's village. If you go to you know, any of the Pacific Islands or uh, you know traditional places where people still live quite traditionally, Visitors, wanderers, generally aren't welcome and there's always going to be a pack of dogs to chase you away. That's how it was for the pilgrims you know, several thousand years ago. Here we have uh, another one and similar situation. This guy's got two sticks. He's smart and here's a dog <laughs> giving him a hard time. Let's do some more. I love this picture. Again, we've got an idealized form of the fool and here's a dog chasing him out of the village and of course there's a crocodile or some sort of monster this is a more traditional one uh, that goes back several hundred years and same situation the guy's got two sticks but it's being chased here's some again we're going back in time and this guy's got his uh, his bag of whatever it is. Maybe it, it could be a cup. It could be a, a, a billy, like a you know what you put on the on the an, on an open fire to boil water in to make your cup of tea and make your soup. And you could put your dried beans in. And you put some herbs in. And if you're lucky, a potato or something. And you'd cook it up. And then you'd eat it straight from the billy can with the a wooden spoon that you've carved yourself. And again, we've got the dog attacking him. Uh, another another one. These are more Id idealized ones. I love this one. This is from the Hanson Roberts deck. Uh, actually, the first tarot deck I got. Absolutely love it. This is Now we're starting to see the rom romanticized modern image of the fool, where is more the innocent, naive fool that I interpret my cards as not the poor fellow that's been chased 
by uh, by the village dog, not the village idiot. Although he is called the fool, and in some readings, particularly for myself, I say, uh, you know, what's happening here? Is this a good decision? And I'll pull the fool, and I've got to say, ooh, does that mean that I'm being an idiot? Am I being a fool? Sometimes it's, that's what it means. That's the interpretation that I get. Other times it's like, yeah, give it a go. Have a crack. Here's another one of the fool. There's some very clever artists out there. That's beautiful. Uh, yeah. Just gets better and better, don't they? <laughs> Another oh, one. This is a beautiful one, the Wanderer. There's the rainbow that forms. And in, in my interpretations of the fool, this is that, that total innocence of you step into, you know, there's a cliff there. Look at it. That's a cliff. And here's that rainbow bridge through the mist. That's that's the codywampler. You know, we're talking codywampling. And we are codywamplers going for a codywample. That, that's a interesting one. The fool. Black cat. Yeah, okay. And that one. So I just wanted to show you those because I, I wanted to just express how important it is for us to look at the context, the historical context of the, the craft or the art that we are working with. And we are working with the tarot. The tarot has a history. The history is embedded in medieval times. And... Yeah, so okay, so the next, my next episode I'll be doing some astrology and looking at the recent Saturn-Jupiter conjunction and Pallas Athene, the asteroid goddess Pallas and the, the conjunction at 29 and 29 degrees Capricorn and 0 degrees of Aquarius. Very significant for me personally because my ascendant is 29 degrees Capricorn and Mandy has asked that, uh, that I look at that for her as well. So I think that'll be an interesting one for all of us that are interested in astrology because I'm looking at, in particular, the orbs applying and separating and the impact on the ascendant. So anyone that has a transit to their ascendant, this, or that have had one in the past or coming up with one, because we all do. It's a circle. They go round and round. Um, this is the next episode is one definitely for you to watch. Okay, thank you for being with me and uh, I'll catch you Coddy Wampling on the next one.